Video game expansion packs are perhaps one of my favorite things in the video game industry. Rather than offering a few outfits or small additions like the usual definition for DLC, an expansion provides more time with the game you love, while also providing new content and new mechanics. Because most players may not buy it as it's not a direct sequel, it allows an opportunity to experiment by trying to tell new stories or use new gameplay systems giving you something you already loved, but packaging it in a way that feels fresh and interesting. The thing that got me into playing World of Warcraft years ago was the box art for the Wrath of the Lich King expansion. Arthas looked so sick, and I wanted to try playing a Death Knight because of it. I wanted to provide a bit of context before making my claim, which may result in me leaving a Chili's and being attacked by fans in the parking lot. That claim being the Witcher 3 expansion, Hearts of Stone, is what I would consider The Witcher 3 experience at its best. So grab a drink, get cozy, and enjoy as I tell you why a consumer product is very cool. So you may be asking why I'm recommending you play Hearts of Stone rather than the base game or even the second expansion, Blood and Wine, which feels like a sequel. I'm doing this for one main strength, scale. If you're watching this video, I assume you have played a video game or maybe watched some TV shows or movies. I want to ask you, how many stories have you experienced with End of the World Stakes, where the fate of the world is doomed if not for the intervention of our heroes? These can lead to fun and engaging stories, they're popular for a reason. But if you're like me, you may be fatigued about saving the world again and again. The bad guy has to be stopped because of course he does, he's the bad guy. I love a good story in a video game, but as great as both The Witcher 3 and Blood and Wine can be, the scale of saving the world or saving the kingdom is something I've done before and I'm not really vibing with at the moment. But what if I told you Hearts of Stone was different? What if rather than saving the world from certain doom, you were deciding the fate of one man? Where you get so involved in this person and his mistakes that you can make a solid case for whatever judgement you choose all at the behest of a being that certainly is not human. If I've interested you, welcome to Hearts of Stone. One day at the White Orchard, Geralt, a mutant monster hunter called a Witcher, notices a interesting Witcher contract, asking to kill a Toad Prince. When he arrives at the client's house, there's a group of rowdy bandits called the Wild Ones. But eventually you come into contact with one Olgir von Everick informing you one of his servants died trying to kiss the Toad Prince in exchange for a happily ever after, but resulting in her untimely death in the sewers. That's a bummer. When talking about price, Olgird is more than happy to give you whatever you desire upon completing your task in the Oxenford sewers. Sneaking into the sewers, you come across an interesting and unexpected sight, that being a former lover by the name of Shawnee, a medic with her own practice. Seeing as the two of you have goals in the sewers, Geralt to kill the toad, Shawnee to collect samples to create an antidote from its bile, decide to catch up and stick together. Finding the beast slayer, Geralt and Shawnee part ways as the beast approaches. The fight itself is pretty routine stuff until near the end. Geralt is hit with a toxin and collapses in the sewers. With clouded vision, he sees a man's corpse emerge from the toad and a group of soldiers in foreign garb rushing to him. When Geralt awakes, he finds himself on a boat for a fury and quickly pieces together his situation with the help of another prisoner. Realizing the beast he had slain was their prince, Geralt will be sentenced to death because of this act. But just as things are looking bleak, Geralt is offered a light in the darkness, or rather, a hand of glass. A being who calls himself Gaunter O'Dim or the Merchant of Glass is willing to offer a chance to escape your fate, but not out of kindness, but out of personal interest. Upon agreeing to meet at the crossroads after escaping, Geralt is branded on his flesh and a storm occurs. After defeating his captors and arriving at the crossroads, Geralt is informed by Gaunter O'Dim that he was set up, that his client knew the repercussions for killing the prince and sent Geralt to take the fall. It is also important to understand that, that the client was responsible for turning the prince into a toad, something related to an estranged marriage, but the more important part is Gaunter O'Dim is ready to cash in that favor. Gaunter has made a deal with someone and gifted him with abilities, but now they aren't willing to honor the conditions of their deal. For the terms of this supernatural contract, Gaunter cannot interfere directly, but if Geralt acts as his proxy, 
he can assist in his efforts. The best part is that Gaunter's business partner and your client are one and the same. That being Olgird von Everick. When you arrive back at the mansion, you find it burning. This can either play out with you fighting Olgird or attempting to be diplomatic. Whatever you choose, a discovery is made. Olgird is immortal. And the pieces of this divine chessboard are set. Olgird has three impossible wishes for you to complete before he honors his contract, and Gontor will provide every bit of assistance he is willing to give, and thus begins your adventure in Hearts of Stone. In previous videos, I talk about deal breakers near the end, but in this case, I think it's imperative to be upfront with what this expansion is and what you should expect. Please know going into it, this expansion is mainly focused on its narrative. That means if you play expansions for huge chunks of side content, this expansion may leave you disappointed in that regard. Hearts of Stone does have some side quests and new features, but they are few and far between, narrowing in on its story and the situations it puts you in. Second, this is a smaller scale affair. You are not visiting a new land in this story, you'll be primarily focused on the city of Oxenfurt, which is already in the base game. Think of it as adding more story to places already seen. This point is more subjective, but I feel it's important to bring up regardless. The expansion clocks in at around 10 hours to do all of its content. For my recording, doing all story quests with the occasional bit of side content, I'm at about 8 hours. So if you're looking for longevity in your expansions, this may not be for you. Hearts of Stone is short in that regard. To be fair, its base price is $10, and it gives you a very engaging story that I was more than happy to buy as a consumer, and I was very satisfied with that decision. But you're your own person, so that decision is always yours. I do want to quickly point out, you can make a character strictly for Hearts of Stone. So if you don't want to play through the entire game just to get to this content, you definitely can, but if you just want to experience this expansion story as soon as possible, it's an option to jump right in. Now that we've got the deal breakers out of the way, I want to talk about the narrative itself by going through each of the three adventures you go on and mentioning characters and moments that are interesting and make this expansion incredible. With that stated, I will be spoiling the story of this expansion, so consider this a spoiler warning. If you do want to play this expansion blind, while I appreciate the views and watch time, I think it would be best for you to leave this video, and if you're interested in my thoughts, come back after you've played it. But for those of you who know the story or are convinced this may not be for them but still want to hear about it, good to have you on board. Now it's time to break out the bubbly or polish off some dance moves because it's time to go to a party. Our first wish from Olgird is to make sure his brother has the time of his life. That seems simple enough, except we have one problem. We don't have any snacks for the party. Also, Olgird's brother Vladimir is dead. Normally, we would need a sorcerer to get in contact with the spirit, but Gaunter suggests we perform a blood ritual and hands us a vial of Vladimir's, suggesting we visit the Von Emberich estate with the help of a particular medic we met in the sewers and head directly to the family crypt. We open the door to Shani's medical practice to find a group of Redanian soldiers discussing important business. Before we go chat, Shani has to create an antidote for the soldiers and heads upstairs. The soldiers look over to Geralt and are like, dang man, she's got looks and brains. Any chance you fancy her? Because all of us think she's great. We'll play it however you wish, but this moment is important as the quest goes on. After the soldiers leave, we catch up with Shani and mention we need assistance getting to the Von Emmerich estate. When that name is mentioned, Shawnee's eyes widen as in college, she took a course on famous Redanian dynasties as an elective. What a coincidence. So we now have a lead, and Shawnee will meet us there, bringing the rest of the supplies we need for the ritual. Making our way to the Von Emmerich estate gives off a completely different feeling from the rest of the world. While the weather was bright and colorful outside, approaching the estate shows a fog covering, suggesting a more melancholic and troubled place than most, something we will experience firsthand as the story progresses. But it's not all bad though, Shani is making a garland with the beautiful flowers outside the estate, a point Geralt mentions saying, I've never seen this romantic side of you, to which Shani responds, well chances are I was working then, but I'm off duty now and then asks if we'd be interested in accompanying her to her friend's wedding. If we respond, be glad to. She says, wonderful. So it's a date. Yes! But the spirit, though. Yeah, that's why we're here. Okay. So we make our way to the crypt and perform the ritual, which summons most of the Von Everichs. 
They are delighted an outsider is contacting their spirits and refuse to let us see Vladimir. So we have ourselves a quick fight. Upon turning this family tree into wood chips, Vladimir reveals himself and commends us for dealing with those. In his words, mm, snobby pricks. When we mention Olgird, Vladimir's face lights up and asks how the old rogue is doing, sharing how the Von Evericks, while currently in a position of wealth, were known for their raiding and fierce prowess. Apparently, Olgird and Vladimir were very close, and it wasn't a surprise to see them fight side by side in combat. But that changed when Vladimir was attacked by five men at the same time, resulting in a heroic last stand that ended with his death. But while talking with the ghost is actually pretty sick, we have a problem. How are we supposed to make him have the time of his life if his body is decomposed? Technically, the only living body is Geralt's and... Oh, well, it looks like our problem is solved. So after a bit of conversing, we come to an agreement. We're definitely going to that wedding Shawnee invited us to, but rather than going as a dashing duo, we're going as a troublesome trio, with Geralt willingly giving up control of his body as Vladimir uses it to have the time of his life accompanying Shawnee. Just before we leave the crypt, Vladimir asks in common Verdanian tongue, Hey broski, this Shawnee girl is the bee's knees and I want to shoot my shot, but I want to check in with you first if you have feelings for her. If so, I promise I'll reel it in and won't make a move. Choose what you will, and it's off to the wedding. The wedding sequence is such a fun point in the quest because it's exactly that, to have fun at a wedding. With Geralt's body, you play as Vladimir and explore the wedding with Shawnee, looking for fun things to do. From drinking with the other guests, to doing our own Witcher investigation, finding the Fire Eater gone missing, only to find the poor man trapped by a terrifying demon. What adds to the jovial nature of this quest is Vladimir himself. Because he's using Geralt's body, Geralt's voice is used to deliver Vladimir's lines. So combine Geralt's deadpan delivery with Vladimir's cheekiness, and you have a recipe for a good time. It's also fun to watch the two argue if Vladimir is taking something too far, or if Geralt is being a real battle axe. It's a fun dynamic where Geralt is the straight man while Vladimir is the goofy one. Exploring the wedding reveals a bit about Vladimir as well. While the wedding is not going entirely the way he was expecting or hoping, He's still making the best of it and having a great time. Vladimir is a rowdy person who means well, but it's the phrases and unintentional offensiveness that he does that gets him into trouble. But he's also someone who can laugh at himself. There's this game of Gwent you can play with a group of gnomes. If you lose, like I did, you must pay 5% of whatever gold you have and wear a pair of donkey ears for the rest of the party. Vladimir is the type of guy who's more than happy to play into the joke and honor the deals he makes if goofed upon in good company. Such is the case when he dons the donkey ears with a smile, indicating to everyone at the party that he is indeed an ass. And while not romantically, Shani warms up to Vladimir as well. He's entirely the opposite of Geralt, but in ways he actually prefers. Like taking a load off and simply enjoying the situations they are presented in, rather than focusing on what needs doing in the future. We'll talk more about this soon, but there's one other interesting note I want to mention before doing so. As the party continues, Gauntar Odim decides to partake in the festivities and chats with a few guests, one of which is Vladimir and Gauntar taunts the Spectre, stating how Olgird was the much greater man than the pale imitation that is his brother. Even having the audacity to say Olgird danced far better than Vladimir ever could, which personally is one giant shuffle too far. But rather than falling to the point of despair and denouncing his brother out of jealousy and pride, Vladimir doubles down and states his love for his brother, even sharing the truth of his death which paints an interesting picture on Olgird. Rather than the first story you heard about the heroic last stand when confronted with five enemies, Vladimir ran away accidentally trapping himself in a cellar where he was cornered and killed. Vladimir was the first to discover his brother's body, and instead of sharing the truth, he fabricated an account of how Vladimir's last moments were him charging his five assailants and taking them all before he died, giving his brother a heroic ending that reality did not allow. Vladimir also shares how Olgird visits his grave constantly, pouring a drink for his brother and reminiscing on the past together. Even if Olgird cannot interact with his brother, Vladimir can see and hear everything Olgird says about him, giving us an example of how Olgird may not be the cruel monster we assume. When the party nears its end, filled with a sense of euphoria, Vladimir writes a letter to his brother, leaving a final message before returning to the family crypt. I didn't record it during this playthrough, but I found the letter online, so I'll read it to you. Olgird, my damn dear brother, you've no idea what joy you've brought me with the idea of showing me a good time. 
True, the man you sent says fitting company for a lark is a hoe handle, but never mind that. What matters is I enjoyed myself. And how? It was a cracking good wedding, with vodka flowing in streams and plenty of pretty things to rest the eyes on. I miss you. But take your time coming to join me. Live and enjoy life. Your brother Vlad. So far, I've been talking about how goofy and fun the wedding section is, but there is one other aspect to it that really grounds the experience. It is an element that balances out all of the fun in a scenario that feels oddly realistic despite its fantasy setting. Okay, now is a great time to talk about our charming wedding guest, Shawnee. She is brought into the story early on and plays a key role in the Dead Man's Party quest and uncovering some interesting information later on. Shawnee is also a romanceable character, and I'm gonna be entirely honest here, her romance is my favorite. Though it's not just because of looks, but one crucial point that makes it amazing. It ends. Romance in video games is kinda weird. The goal seems to be getting players to grow an attachment to a character to better immerse themselves in the experience, but most of the time how it's handled in RPGs, it comes across as self-congratulatory to the player and feels sort of pandering rather than adding to the experience. And I don't mean to morally position myself here saying that all romances in video games are dumb. There was a time where I really enjoyed this type of romance in a rather embarrassing way. When I played Fire Emblem Fates years ago, I picked the Conquest version, which had me siding with Norn for what I thought at the time were for two very strong reasons. Now, the reason I bring up this point and that embarrassing story is because I want to highlight how great of a job The Witcher 3 does romances. Rather than feeling like the player is romancing these characters, there's enough characterization of Geralt to where it feels like Geralt is having a romance instead. You're choosing what he says, but there's enough distance between you and Geralt where it doesn't feel like a self-insert and Geralt can come into his own. And because of that, the relationships feel believable. There are jokes and tender loving moments and fights. And at the end of the day, it's two people choosing to spend time together. Geralt and Shawnee have great chemistry together. There is clearly love the two share for each other, but that love cannot be the only thing that makes them stay. These are people from two different worlds, one of the path hunting monsters, the other a doctor for the everyman. Compared to other romance options with powerful sorcerers like Yennefer and Triss, Shawnee is just a human, a gifted and brilliant doctor, but a human nonetheless. What she wants out of a relationship and a partner isn't a burst of fun for a few weeks at a time, but someone stable who will be there through the good and the bad. And it's highlighted through the party why Geralt and Shawnee just wouldn't work in the long term. While at first annoyed at Vladimir, Shawnee warms up to the Spectre because he's everything Geralt isn't. He's willing to make a fool out of himself, he's expressive, and most importantly, he's willing to fully embrace things outside of his work, something that Geralt is unable to do. As experienced in the party, where rather than making the best out of it like Vladimir, Geralt seems impatient to carry on with his other tasks, something Shawnee notices and saddens her. When the party wraps up, the task is completed, and Geralt must be on his way. Shawnee understands, but you can clearly see the disappointment on her face as she makes her way back to the party. And it's at this point where Gontaro Dim arrives in what can be considered his finest bro move and tells Geralt to surrender to the human connection that is spontaneous honesty. Seize the night. Seize your chance. Enjoy one another. That's it. Have fun. After picking up the perfect gift for our wedding date with the ancient art of listening to people, we get back to the wedding, we sit down with Shawnee, and talk. She brings up a very insightful point about being alone. If you click the dialogue option, you've got me, she says this. For how long? A day? Two? Don't get me wrong. It's nice, but you come and go. Yet I need someone who'll be there every night when I come home. After a day of bandaging wounds and sewing up guts, I need a good glass and a good laugh with someone who'll help me forget it all for a moment. And that's such a cool moment. While it's a game with monsters and magic and fantasy spectacle, having Shawnee explain what she wants and articulating exactly how difficult it would be to continue this romance is brilliant. And on that note, Geralt completely agrees. 
but the two have one beautiful night together and they certainly are going to waste it. In the light of day, the romantic feelings they harbor will be snuffed out, but before that, the two will surrender to spontaneous honesty. I love this part of the expansion so much, because even though you're Geralt of Rivia, a famous monster hunter extraordinaire and seasoned adventurer, there are consequences to your work, and that may push you from those you love on a different path. But what I love even more is the maturity and honesty behind it. We're all going to meet people we care about and love, which can lead us to realizing we want different things. But we shouldn't compromise what we want for the other person out of fear of splitting apart. Because in the end, that's not doing anyone any favors, and that cheapens what both of you want. And by having a love story where two people who care about each other so much realize they are just after different things and mutually agree to end it is perhaps one of the most matured depictions of romance I've ever seen. If the first wish didn't give it away, the tasks Olgir desires will be moving away from conventional heroics and entering into morally ambiguous and occasionally surreal activities, especially so for the second wish, starting as a simple visit to an auction house in Oxenfurt and culminating into a fantasy bank heist. All of this begins with what appears to be a simple request, obtain Bersadi's house. The details are vague, but that's the goal, anyway. Making our way to the auction house, it appears the owner Horst Bersadi is currently busy and will be so until after the auction, so it is time to flex our coin purse from monster hunting and buy out all of these items on sale even if we have no use for them, just to spite most of the nobility. But not this lady, she's great, though we will be doing so out of respect. After playing a Polish remaster of the auction house minigame from Wind Waker, we come into contact with Horst, and as soon as we mention knowing about the house, Horst begins panicking and throws us out of his establishment. Well, thrown out is a bit strong and giving too much credit, more like walking us out and attempting to beat us up, only to be gifted with an early summons to the hospital. Though our display appeared to have interested someone, one cloaked in a black garb and questionable intentions, but one thing we can agree on is that we all want to make our way into the auction house vault. So an agreement is struck. In exchange for getting our temporary ally into the auction vault, we will be rewarded with the Bursadi house, which our ally claims will be there. While a plan is created, it's impossible to do alone. So it looks like we're gonna need some additional hands for this five finger discount. We got a total of two options for two rolls. We need someone who can open the vault, either with light fingers or heavy explosives, your pit, and we'll need someone agile enough to provide a vertical advantage. We've got options for those too. On top of that, we need someone to bribe the guard's cook to poison the food, making the patrols lighter than usual. Making the preparations for the heist is a fun process because it adds a combination of role playing and planning. For the heist, Geralt says and will make a point of not wanting to kill anyone. You can argue it may be an act of compassion for those involved in this seemingly selfish request of his, or to minimize the amount of trouble they'll get if they're caught. Regardless of the hopes for the mission, you get to choose your approach. Are you planning to be quiet and thorough or loud and quick? Whatever approach and person you pick for the safe will have consequences as the quest continues. Unfortunately for our acrobatic options, it appears one of them was killed before we could get to him, so that leaves our only option being the elf Evelyn, but she more than makes up for this lack of choice. After dealing with the cook, we meet up with our partners in crime and decide to hit the auction house, but even as we begin, things take a rocky start. It looks like guards were in the tower, which we weren't expecting, though our group is good at improvising. It's at this point where our temporary ally is more unreliable than we expected. The intel he learned and based this heist off of is faulty. On top of that, he hasn't given us his name and has been very paranoid about the whole situation. Anyway, we make our way into the house and what a surprise, it turns out the info was faulty. Again! So we have a fight on our hands. Geralt and a few others may be attempting to minimize the bloodshed by fighting with wooden swords, but our employer is more than happy to kill for his payday. But our situation gets even worse. Redanian soldiers are positioned outside, and it is our job to stall for as long as the safe cracker needs. Whoever we picked will affect the overall outcome of the negotiations. No matter what we choose, Evelyn decides now is a great time to bail, and honestly, I don't blame her. There are no friends in this business. Anyway, we make our way into the vault, finding the horse with two additional guards, and the truth is revealed. 
Our employer turns out to be Horst's brother and was infiltrated the vault in hopes of revenge against being cast out of the family for problematic behavior. At this point, we can choose our allegiances. We can either stick with our employer or join with Horst and be rewarded. Regardless of who you pick, a fight will ensue and one brother will kill another. No matter which brother you choose, the one you picked will refuse to give you the contents of this model house you desire. This leads to an interesting decision. You can either kill that brother for the house and its contents, or, in a move that would make Gontaro Dim very proud, you may ask only for the model house and leave the documents contained in the vault, to which the brother of your choice will agree. Making your way back to Olgird, he will either express his approval at your accomplishment or disappointment on cheating him on a verbal technicality and explain afterward why this mattered to him. Olgird states his family was in a difficult financial situation after a poor investment, and the Brasati family were the ones supplying the loan. When they discovered this, they demanded immediate payment, but without the proper amount of time, this was impossible. So Olgird pleaded for time, but the Brasatis rejected this plea and sold every one of the Von Everick's possessions at the auction. So Olgird swore revenge for his family and hoped to turn the documents of the late Brasati's will, which were contained in that house, to the public, which would legally state if the Brasati brothers were unable to come together at the appointed times displayed in the will, their assets would be given back to the community, helping those less fortunate. But Olgird wasn't doing this out of the kindness in that void that was once a heart, but rather to ruin the Brasati family, just as they ruined his. But regardless of how it turned out, we have one last request from Mr. Von Everick, and it's perhaps the most illuminating of Olgird himself. This final wish is perhaps the most mind-bending and melancholic of the three, leading to a conclusion that still sticks with me even as I record this. Olgird asks you to bring him a rose he gave his wife. It's colored purple, so it'll be much easier to spot if it's any consultation compared to others. So we make our way back to the Von Everick family crypt, but we go further into the family estate this time, a once beautiful location preyed upon by the effects of time. We come across a cat showing us around, and a hulking and terrifying individual simply named the caretaker burying a recent explorer. When we defeat him, the cat and dog reveal themselves to be servants of Iris von Emmerich and inform us she resides upstairs, but with the state of the house and the spectre wearing black, you may already know what to expect. Iris von Emmerich is dead, and the rose has already wilted. Iris's heart bursts due to loneliness, but our four-legged friends are bound to serve even after her death, and assist us with the possibility of freedom. So the only way to contact Iris' spirit is to hold a service for her. So making our way to Iris' favorite spot of the estate, the garden where she would paint, we hold a service. One point that is a bit sad about this moment was Iris' fear that she would die and no one would rest her remains or say a kind word for her passing. Geralt may not have known her, but I tried to pick some parting words based on things I learned about her, where her passions lie, and I think it was a really quiet and beautiful moment. Can't say much about Iris von Everick, but I do know I like her paintings. It's a shame her art couldn't bring her greater comfort. At times, fate muddles our path, and life turns toilsome, hard to bear, yet all deserve respite and peace in death. Iris's spirit is contacted, and she allows us entry into her painted world, this beautiful background where happy and painful memories lie, and nightmares roam. And here, we get an interesting view of Olgird von Everick from the closest person in his life, and a clear picture begins to form of the man. These memories are scattered throughout the house in puzzles, so I'll try my best to give you the whole picture in this video. So early on into the marriage, Olgird and Iris were passionately in love. They had a level of respect and care for each other. But much like other weddings, complications began to form. Iris's family looked down upon Olgird for the company he keeps with bandits and the financial state of his family name. Iris didn't seem upset by this, but it angered Olgird greatly that he couldn't provide for his wife without her parents' handouts. This fixed in his mind, Olgird desperately looked for a solution to his family's problems. And one night after drinking in a moment of weakness, comes across a certain man willing to offer a helping hand, offering a deal of sorts, helping to solve his problem, but at an unspecified and heavy price. In exchange for immortality and riches, Olgird was given a metaphorical, and I suppose physical, heart of stone, 
emotions that were once natural became muted and dull, pushing him to do extreme acts in the hopes of feeling these emotions again, but all it did was affect those around him. Such was the case when Iris's father attempted to stand up for his daughter and demand a separation, resulting in a quick and shocking death against a column. And for the rest of Iris's life, she was spent locked away in the house, with the four-legged servants and the caretaker to look after her by Olgird's command. There was no love anymore, rather obligation on Olgird's part and bitterness and isolation from Iris's, eventually ending with Olgird leaving Iris in an attempt at protecting her from what he had become, leaving a violet rose and a letter behind. And it's at this moment we come across Iris's greatest fear. Throughout the level, we keep seeing a figure through her memories, that figure being Olgird von Everick, or at least the Olgird that Iris had seen for most of her marriage, culminating in this visually fantastic boss fight. After the fight, this is the moment I was leading up to, the moment where you talk with the spirit of Iris von Everick and decide what fate awaits her. What's surprising is after defeating her greatest fear, Iris knows what happened to her husband and asks him out of genuine love, cursing the day Gontaro Dim made a deal for her benefit. And it's when we're asking for the rose where the decision gets morally ambiguous. It turns out the rose acts as a pin for Iris to be connected to this plane of existence, and by removing the rose, Iris and everything here will disappear into nothingness. And what makes this even worse is Iris expressing her fear of what lies beyond. There's no one to reassure her how it'll turn out. This is something she would experience alone. I didn't mention this earlier, but Geralt's voice actor here is excellent in this scene. Geralt has a very dry and gruff vocal delivery which fits the character well, but in this conversation with Iris, we can notice him talk in a more soft-spoken delivery, offering the most amount of sympathy and compassion he can. In fact, this moment of dialogue is one I keep thinking about years after I played this expansion. And what will happen then? Shall I be free of the suffering, the sadness? Is it the void that awaits? I don't know. This moment is heartbreaking. Do you take the only thing left in this person's life, which is the one thing keeping them here in this limbo, a person who has suffered so much from someone who once loved her and left her to die alone? Or do you deny taking it, complete the task on a technicality, and allow her to spend the rest of eternity in a shrine to the past? On my recent playthrough, I asked for the rose, and I would be lying if I said I didn't start tearing up at this moment. I've played games where my goal was to save the world, but to decide the fate of someone who has gone through so much with suffering from the past or damning her to the unknown is a task that is rather unique to me. Whatever you pick, you make your way back to Oxenfurt to turn in your proof on completion, and for the first time in the entire game, it begins to snow. Our adventure is nearing its end. We head back to the inn where Olgird has been residing, only to find him away and replaced with Gaunter Odim, who praises us for our work, saying all we have to do is have Olgird visit us at a specific temple. And before leaving, we can ask questions of Gaunter. One of the most interesting is asking what he is, and he replies with this. Do you really wish to know? Yes. No, Geralt. You don't. This one time I shall spare you, and not grant your wish. In the aftermath of this cutscene and future events, Gontor Odim comes across as the story's villain. After all, he technically sent all the events with Olgird in motion as soon as they made a pact. But what Gontor argues, and argues reasonably, is that he is giving those who make a contract precisely what they ask for. It's not his fault they're asking for selfish requests or don't choose their words carefully. Gunter is also shown to manipulate time, stopping it entirely for your conversation at the inn, and the Merchant of Glass takes this opportunity to play around with its effects, from putting a fly in someone's soup to brutally punishing someone for interrupting his business earlier. And an important note is that Gunter can stop time and punish anyone he pleases at any moment, yet if he's such an evil character, why wouldn't he be using it more often, and why wouldn't we see it through our adventure? He makes appearances on our missions and guides events to play out in a particular way, but if he has such control, why does he limit his use of it? Why are packs such a vital detail he honors, 
when he could just take what he desires. I was thinking these thoughts after our conversation. Now we can head straight over to the temple to complete the expansion, or if we want to come more prepared, we can visit Shawnee who will give us a lead on a researcher of Gaunter Odim. This professor we come across is a unique case, spending the rest of his days in a symbol to protect himself from evil. This academic explains the horror of our employer, sharing the fact after reading information on what Gaunter was, he has gone blind from such a terrifying discovery. And it's here that we learn the truth behind Olgir's pact. When Olgir made his pact with Gaunter, his exact words were, I wish to win back Iris's hand and have my fortune restored, and then live like there was no tomorrow. But to accomplish such a wish, there would have to be a cost. The two people Olgird cared the most about were his betrothed and his dear brother Vladimir. One of them would have to die to make this pact possible. Olgird made his choice, and the next day Vladimir was killed by five men cowering in a cellar. This offers a reason why Olgird asked you to take his brother out for the time of his life, because his actions took Vladimir's and Olgird feels a sense of guilt doing that to his greatest friend. But with that, the contract was confirmed, and Olgird would give up his soul after he was granted three wishes, and they stood on the moon together. But just like any dealings with Gontaro Dim, every single word is essential in dealing with wishes, especially so in a contract. Olgird was given the gift and eventually the curse of immortality. At first, immortality seems pretty sick. You have all the time in the world and nothing is impossible. But it's mortality that makes things meaningful. Our bodies grow and diminish, our friendships form and eventually break apart, and everything we create will be forgotten. But it's in the act of engaging with those despite knowing it doesn't matter in the long run that makes them important. But with the last part missing, Olgird's emotions become deadened creating a being with a heart of stone. And now that we know how Olgird came to this situation, you may sympathize with him or despise him. But before you leave, the professor shares an exciting point. Gautaro Dim has been around for a long time and has been making deals with people for countless generations. Yet there was one man who beat Gautaro Dim, not in a physical battle but rather a game of wits, resulting in the man getting off scot-free defeating an all-powerful being with just his mind alone, so we might be able to make a deal if we need to. Now the time has finally come to see this adventure through. At the Temple of Levani, we wait until Olgird von Everick arrives at the top. There we have the last conversation before making our choice. Sharing our results on the final wish and see Olgird quite remorseful of his actions and how he treated his wife. But his moment is short-lived as Olgird feels a burning pain in his chest. A shock considering he shouldn't be able to feel pain and Gontor Odin makes his way from the sky to us. Olgird restates the conditions of the pact for with three wishes and before he can finish, Gontor replies with and that we stand together on the moon. That's certainly not a good sign for the immortal. Especially so when Gontor moves his hand, dissipating the sand below us, revealing a symbol below the ground. That being a moon. Olgird, realizing that his contract had been fulfilled but not in the way he expected, begins to panic, while Gontar simply makes his way to the man to take what they agreed upon. It's in this moment of utter terror from Olgird and satisfaction from Gontar where you make your choice. Do you let Gontar carry out the deal and take Olgird's soul, or do you attempt to outwit the Merchant of Mirrors at his own game at the risk of losing your own? The game has been building to this moment, making either choice satisfying and, dare I say, great and fitting endings. While attempting to save Olgird can be argued, and argued quite well as a good choice, I think that puts Gaunter in an evil light where it seems more complicated than that. For every soul that Gaunter has, there is always a contract to obtain it. He's not going around and taking souls because there are rules and conditions that must be met. And in this example, Olgird came to Gaunter for this deal. And just like Gaunter argued in the bar, he gives people exactly what they asked for even if they don't see the consequences in their desires. Olgird even tried to break the deal after Gaunter honored his end of the bargain, asking for three wishes that should have been impossible to accomplish and standing on the moon, a condition Olgird thought was impossible. But that's the interesting thing about Gaunter. Words are a tool and Gaunter finds a use for every single one he deploys, completing his tasks on technicalities that others may not consider as a possibility could have been hinted at if your version of Geralt technically completed wishes two and three with the model house and the rose painted by Iris. 
But while Ogier got more than he signed up for, shouldn't he be punished for the actions he has committed now? He turned a romantic prospect of Iris into a monster and sent you to kill him, leading to a chance at your death and the complete dethroning of a government. He stayed at someone's manor, causing one of his men to murder the lord and burn down their home. He trapped a messenger in a barrel for days. Olgird is a sympathetic character, but does that sympathy excuse all that he has done, or do his actions invoke punishment? If you pick the latter, Geralt will stand by as Gaunter takes Olgird's soul in a pretty horrifying moment. Afterwards, Gaunter thanks Geralt for his time, removes the brand, and rewards him for completing his task. You can wish for some pretty cool stuff, but after seeing how Gaunter ends a deal, I chose not to take the risk of a technicality in my words and turn down the reward. Gaunter nods and leaves, whistling the Man of Mirrors nursery rhyme as the title card fades into the sky, offering an end to our adventure. But what if, for whatever reason you decide, choose to stand up for your fellow man from an otherworldly being? This leads to a game of Gaunter's creation, where you have to solve a riddle before time runs out in the hourglass. This takes place in a realm of Gaunter's creation and contains monsters and incorrect guesses to slow you down. But if you're clever enough to solve the riddle, the Merchant of Glass will be banished to another plane of existence for a time, but not before clapping for your accomplishment of outsmarting Gaunter Hodim. Eventually, the sun rises as you and Olgird share a drink, recalling your adventures and the circumstances leading up to it. Olgird is now mortal and in ruin, but he has decided to make the best of it, choosing to find a new path and purpose. As a token of his thanks, he offers you his family sword, but upon accepting it, you accidentally cut Olgird to where he winces in pain. Geralt apologizes, but Olgird, realizing he can feel pain for the first time in such a long time, simply says, you needn't be. As Olgird leaves, we are left in the dawn of a new day as the title card fades in, concluding our adventure. Hearts of Stone is a beautiful experience, offering a unique adventure that lasts for as long as it needs to. It's short, sweet, and I loved every second of it. If I've piqued your interest or you just want to play something unique, totally give it a shot. I hope you have a great time with it, and thank you very much for watching this video. This is my longest video yet, and I hope you liked it. Feel free to leave a like or dislike or comment to share your thoughts, and subscribe if you want to see my future videos, but I'm not your dad, so do whatever you please. My name is Polly Macho, or you can just call me Alex, and I hope you have a great day. Later.